Many of us don't discover until college or beyond that the lessons of American history, as taught in most K through 12 schools, are missing more than a few pages. We're told of the heroes of the revolution, told of Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, told of Lincoln's assassination and maybe the actual reasons behind it. We're also told that cowboys were the good guys and Indians were the bad guys. Thank goodness for libraries. Thank goodness for curious minds. And now, thank goodness for cell phones. We are where we are in 2020 because the entire planet can see criminal injustices too blatant to shrug off, too brutal to tolerate, too frightening to accept. Make no mistake though, such atrocities were occurring long before they were being posted on social media accounts. Among the worst was the 1921 destruction of a Tulsa, Oklahoma neighborhood that was constructed and maintained by the black community. Some know the story, many do not. But the truth cannot hide forever. Welcome to another episode of Race in America, a candid conversation. I'm Monty Poole, my co-host is Logan Murdoch. And this week we are pleased to welcome uh, former NBA players, two of them in fact. One, Eton Thomas, uh, who was, since his NBA career has ended, has become a poet, a lecturer, a uh, motivational speaker, and also of course, a community activist. He is very active in the community. And the other is Kalena Azabuki, former Warriors player uh, who is now an analyst, you might say, for Warriors basketball on NBC Sports Bay Area. And first of all, I want to start with you, uh, Eton. Being that this week, uh, Juneteenth is, is Friday night tonight, you, were, you grew up in Tulsa. You knew what it was like to experience the history of Black Wall Street. Tell me a little bit about that, that particular time and what happened in 1921. Well, first of all, thanks for having this discussion and uh, much respect to Kalena, you know, because, you know, from Tulsa, you know, always represent and always carries themselves well. And, you know, it, it, I, I enjoyed watching you play your whole career. Um, so, so growing up in Tulsa, you know, I learned about Black Wall Street, you know, in middle school, you know, I went to Carver Middle School with the Booker T. Washington High School. And that was part of our, our, our education process. You know, it wasn't until I left and went to Syracuse that I realized that a lot of people outside of Oklahoma weren't really familiar with Black Wall Street. And I remember sitting in this lecture hall, uh, it was about 25 people, 250 people. And, you know, only a few people knew or was even familiar with what happened with the Tulsa massacre. And I was surprised, I was like, wait, none of y'all know what happened? And I think the other person was somebody from Texas and, you know, somebody from like around Oklahoma. Um, but yeah, I, a lot of people didn't know. So what happened was just to break it all down real quick is, you know, the, the, the black community at that time, the Greenwood district, um, and this happened in a lot of different places, a lot of different communities and cities as well around the country, but it was during, during the time of segregation, you know, you talk, you hear about the, the black dollar circulating and, you know, going out right now. And as soon as it comes in the black community, well, then it was different. The black, the black dollar stayed in the black community. Number one, we had no choice. It was segregation, you know, and then we just built our own community. So we didn't have to go across the railroad tracks for anything. And, and across the railroad tracks is the, the white part of town. So we had our own stores, our own restaurants, um, you know, grocery stores, uh, movie theaters, everything that we needed, we had. And basically, um, white people got jealous. That's basically what it was and a, a concerted effort. And it was strategically planned because there were bombs that were that were dropped and you know the police came and they were you know um you know looting and they looted all the stores and they they robbed everybody and they were just shooting black people and it was you know the stores were put on fire and the, and the fire people firemen was there and not putting it out and stopping anybody from you know it was really a concerted effort so that's the history of that area and then they they built a highway through it and now you know because my mom literally lives um, 10 minutes from where it was. So, and, you know, Carver Middle School is like right down the street from it. So I was, 
I grew up right there. So it would, it was just part of my education process growing up. I'm going to ask someone who also um, spent much of his childhood in Tulsa. Um, what was your experience how, and how was it different from that of uh, Eton? So first of all, like Eton said, most respect to Eton. I, I loved watching him play in Tulsa. He was one of the big superstars coming out and we all support each other. So it's great to see him and be on this conversation with him. For me in Tulsa, I went to a Christian school called Victory Christian School. And there and anywhere else I was in Tulsa, the, the racism was subtle, really subtle. Like in school, there'd be white kids that would make comments, black jokes here and there, things like that. And when it came to cops, I didn't really have too many run-ins in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I remember being with my AAU team and we were just walking down the street and the cops pulled up and handcuffed us and questioned us. And I really can't even remember what the reason was. And now I know it was just because we were black and we maybe looked a little suspicious. And so that, that was pretty much the extent of, of my dealings with the cops growing up in Tulsa. And it wasn't until I moved away from Tulsa and was in even Oakland at times. There were some run-ins here and there. One, one cop stopped me in Oakland. I think I had tinted windows and he questioned me. He was like, is this your car? Or is this your parents' car? And just comments like that, um, there was an issue. There's a, a time in New York where I got stopped by the police and, and was held a little longer, and there was racial profiling involved. But in Tulsa, Oklahoma, it's funny, growing up there, in school, they didn't teach us about Black Wall Street. It wasn't until later on in life where I actually learned about, about Black Wall Street and everything that happened there. So to me, that's just kind of part of the system. Like a school, even in Tulsa, where it happened, didn't want to divulge that information and make sure everybody knew exactly what happened back then. And so me as a black person could understand the extent of kind of what we're up against or what we're fighting or what the fight has been, what it's entailed and what people are capable of. So I'm glad I learned about it later and, and understood that, but that's not good. That's not good that, that schools aren't talking about, all those things that happen, they're kind of picking and choosing different little things from history to, to share about maybe the things that aren't as, as, as stark and the things that are nice, they kind of take those and, and put those in the history books and, and make sure the kids learn about that. But it's important for, for not just black kids, but for, for kids from every race to realize what it was like back then, what happened, what we're up against, because that kind of hate can be learned. It is learned, and it's important for kids to understand what happened so they can combat that and fight that, and that's important to me. So it's, it's interesting, two kind of different backgrounds from the same place. My school definitely didn't talk about it, and I learned about it much later, and Eton's school was different there, and he was more informed about it at an earlier age, which I think is much better. So that's kind of how it went for me, and I, and I hope that – schools nowadays are are putting those kinds of things in the history books so black kids and not just black kids but kids from every race understand what we're dealing with here and i think to put we should really put this in perspective this was a grave tragedy the black wall street um not only especially uh big enough on what Eton said this is a a tragedy where 36 square blocks were completely destroyed you know, people uh, were using airplanes to shoot down at people. And you got to know, this was 1921, where airplanes were relatively new inventions. So uh, we, I just started knowing this, and I just found this out. And um, my question is to both of you guys, I want to start with Eton, is how important is it for, for people to learn this in schools as a part of a curriculum? Because uh, we just talked about with you, Eton, knowing it at your school, and you... Uh, Kalena not knowing it at your school, how important is it to, for this to be in a curriculum for mainstream um, education right now? Oh, it's definitely important. I mean, but there's, there's, you know, Black history has to become part of the regular curriculum that, that is taught to students, mm -hmm. especially if you have students of different races. I mean, it's, and, but, but we've had, and you know, my mother's a teacher in Tulsa Public Schools, 
And so we had a whole separate education that we had aside from what we learned in school. And she started that when we was in elementary school. Like that, that was just the process. We just knew that was going to happen. We had our own book reports that we had to do. And there were book reports on books that they didn't even talk about in our schools. You know what I mean? I mean, and, and our school, and I went to school on the, on the black side of town, on the north side, you know, and Carver and Booker T are like the staple of the north side. And we still were taught a lot more than what Kalena was taught in Victory Christian Center, but it still wasn't, you know, what it should have been. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it shouldn't be up to the, you, you, you know, at home to be able to teach, to have to teach and educate your, your children. But right now, that's really where we are. And, and when we have to educate our children home, the same way that, that, that Jewish kids go to Hebrew school, that's basically what we have to do. They go to Hebrew school to be able to talk about their heritage, their culture, their history, and they have a firm foundation about who they are in society and where their history and comes from. They have a whole gambit, and that's when they're young. Yeah. That's what we got to do. You know what I mean? And, and it, of course, it should be taught in schools, but I, it's, it's not. And the same way that Jewish people don't leave it up to the schools to teach their children about themselves, that's that's not what we should have to do either. I totally agree. And, and it's important for awareness because when you're aware of something, what people are capable of, what's happened in the past, what we're up against, you know how to operate. You can operate a little differently, right? You can practice restraint if you know what people are capable of, what has happened in the past, where we come from. Like, just... Just thinking about that story in Black Wall Street, it's like, are you kidding me? If, when I heard about this, I was like, man, I knew about racism and 400 years of this this fight we've been in and slavery and all that. But just to, to learn about what happened there, it was surprising to me. And just knowing that I felt like I was equipped with that knowledge, I could make sure that I'm not surprised by anything. People talk about being woke. It's just being aware and making sure you understand what people are capable of. So you're not surprised by anything. You can practice restraint. You can combat, you can combat evil with, with love and, and make sure you're ready for whatever happened. Now, nothing really surprises me. So if someone comes just as simple as someone saying something racist or some racist comment, I don't have to stoop down to their level. I'm aware that that still exists. I'm aware where we've come from, what the fight has been, the, the years, the, the centuries of, of this struggle that we've been in. And so now I can operate and understand what I'm dealing with here. And, and I don't have to stoop down to their level. I'm in control of my actions now. Whereas if, if I didn't know about what happened with Black Wall Street, I didn't know about what the fight has been, then I'd be surprised. Then maybe I'd be getting in fights. Then maybe I'd be impulsive and, and, and acting out and acting out of anger. Which is, which is never healthy and acting out of a place of fear of cops and all those different things. And, and that's not really healthy for us. So I think awareness is key. So we can dictate how we act and how we operate. And, and, and coming from a place of love is, is always the best way to deal with this. And the only way to, to combat evil is with good. And it's, but it's important to know how deep the evil runs and where we've come from, the evil that's happened in the past and, and what we're up against. You now we're talking about certain gaps in, in history that aren't taught uh, in school curriculum and so forth. And to me, I feel sort of that way about Juneteenth. Um, we, we, most of us now, all of us should know what that date represents, June 19th today. And my question to, first of all, Ita, is when was that taught to you and what's the significance of that date in terms of what it meant for the freeing of slaves? Well, I mean, again, it was taught to us at an early age. I mean, we had a big Juneteenth celebration, you know, every, every summer, you know, in Tulsa. I remember going there and seeing Wayman Tisdale play, the Gap Band, you know, these are all Tulsa legends. And we had a big celebration. So that's why when, when Trump um, announced that he was having his, the start of his, his campaign, on Juneteenth in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I was like, wow, like that. And, and right now, you know, he changed and say he's going to have it on a different day out of respect. But, you know, he, th- that's not something that he shouldn't have already known. You know what I mean? I mean, he's the president of the United States. You can't claim ignorance on certain things. Like, it's like, okay, man, bro, come on now. You're, you know, you, you should know this already. If, if there's a way that you, a reason why you picked Tulsa, Oklahoma, 
You know, I don't, I don't believe that he did it. No, he did it for a reason. And those, those are the dog whistles that, that he sends. And the thing about it, and I've been, you know, following, I have all my, my friends that are still in Tulsa and everything like that. There's been this great display of black and white unity in Tulsa since George Floyd was murdered. There's honestly, and, and this is really all around the country, but I'm, you know, specifically in Tulsa, and all my friends tell me like, there's more white people out marching and protesting than they've ever seen in their life over a black man being murdered by the police. And this is, there's an awakening. It's like, it's different now, you know, and they're, they're, they're not just chanting Black Lives Matter, but they're trying to implement programs and make changes that to, to force companies to, to show that Black Lives Matter. You know what I mean? They're formulating things to, and working with Tiffany Crutcher, who, whose uh, brother Terrence Crutcher was, was murdered by the police in Tulsa, and trying to, trying to formulate ways to create police reform. All this wonderful stuff is happening in Tulsa, and if y'all don't know Tulsa, it, it's, you know, that doesn't happen regularly, like every other place. But so then, to, to have all of that happening, and then announce that Trump is going to come down there and have a rally. Now, there's certain demographic that comes out for Trump's rallies. And then it's just like, oh, so all of the progress that they made is just going to be messed up now because then you're going to have a counter protest. They're going to have, you know, other people marching. There's going to be this friction and the police are going to come. And like, that's what, what my mind automatically went to. And that's why it was like, come on now, that's, that's, that's just not good for Tulsa. <laughs> so that, that's, what, that's what I thought. You can tell me what you thought, Kalina, but that was, that was what my mind automatically went. I had similar thoughts. Any, anything that divides us, I'm, I'm not for it. So same thoughts there. But with, with Juneteenth, I learned about that in, in high school. We talked about it as a family. And for me, it just signifies our strength. It just shows the strength of our people, the, the black community. And it also makes me thankful to the people that fought so hard that were in those more than stressful situations, impossible situations, and and kept a positive attitude, banded together, and and found a way out of it. And it's it's us overcoming, and it's just strength. It's strength. So that's that's what I think of. And listen, the the people from all races celebrating this is is a beautiful thing to me because we all should celebrate it. It's any human race, any race that's in that predicament and gets out of it should be celebrated. And, and listen, we want equality and justice for everybody and we're still working towards that and we have a, a long way to go in this country. But I've been, I've been really encouraged with the peaceful protests, everything that's happened after George Floyd. Things are happening. Obviously, people are stepping up. People are making monster donations. And, and it's, it's a pivotal time in history. And I think I'm encouraged by this generation because this generation is, is fearless now. And, and there's, there's a rambunctiousness to the way they operate. And, and you got social media now. So even if there's an agenda when it comes to the mainstream media and the things that they want to push out, a lot of times you can look on social media on Twitter and, and people will be showing videos that maybe the mainstream media doesn't want to see and so it, it's it's a different it's a different kind of dynamic when you have everybody connected like that and and information being put out on a lot of different platforms. So I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged, and I think there's there's a lot more to do. I love how people are really stepping up from all races. And I love seeing white people and, and Asians and everybody out there protesting and letting their voices be heard because. It's going to take all of us. It's not just going to take black people to to end racism, which is, you know, it's it's so many different aspects to to that word. But it's going to take all of us, all of us together, looking at ourselves, coming from a place of love, and doing everything we can to bring about change. One thing that I, I did um, see when I was researching the Black Wall Street is. Uh, I couldn't help but think, what if that happened today? Um, I, I know back then it was covered a lot differently um, from two separate newspapers. You had the black side, which was telling the black story, and then you had the the white newspapers inciting these actions. So if you guys were to see um, Black Wall Street, if it happened a week ago, how do you think it was, the response would have been different today? 
Well, it's a different time now, though. I mean, it's it's like you said, like, you know, that there was, um, you know, planes were just now kind of introduced. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, you know, they were, they looked up and they they saw these bombs coming from the sky. You know what I mean? And they, they saw these people blowing up. Now, is it far-fetched to think that something like this can happen today? I mean, when you look at the, the, the um, uprisings in different places, you look at what's happening in, like in Atlanta, say Atlanta for, for, for over the weekend. That's the most recent um, example. So you saw all the protesters out. And I know, you know, black and white protesters that were out, right? Then one thing happens, and then it's like everything swoops down with the, with, the, with the police. And it's not the local police. It's the state troopers, the state police. Like, if you have accounts from everybody there, they're like, no, no, no. The local police, you know, they were, they were okay. They were engaging us. They were talking to us, everything like that. But it's the state troopers that came in, the people who are not, you know, in the community policing. And then it's a whole different thing. And you saw, like, I mean, hearing the, the, the recollections of what happened and the reenactments of what happened down there and the way that they, you know, it was like military formation. And then they moved here and they moved these people here and they came with trucks here and they came with the, t- like, it, it's not far-fetched that something like what happened with the Tulsa massacre could happen again. That's my point in saying that. You know, and especially when you see the militarization of the police. And that's why when people are, st- are speaking about defunding the police okay they're not saying disbanding the police where there's no police disfunding and disbanding are two completely different words this defunding is where you are redirecting some of the resources that you have going towards the police to come down in army tanks during a protest right with all this gear meanwhile you have schools right there that can't get books you know what i mean you have programs right there that are all underfunded you have all these different so instead of put like funneling all that money to the police distributed different places you know and right now with Tulsa Police Department th- you look at the line items right now and where the Tulsa Police Department is and where Tulsa is and on education in the country it's like 49th in the country you know you know what i mean like you know victory is a special school booker t washington is a special school Right, Tulsa Public School. I mean, let's be honest, right, Kalina? It's it's it's, it's low. So there are so many different things, and it's you know, and one of the things that Tiffany Crutcher always says, I do a lot of work with her there, is that it's the way that we police of what we want to change. You know, we can't. She says you can't legislate somebody's heart. So she's getting down to the point where you know, I can't, I can't make you look at me a certain way. You know, she's, she's kind of given up with sensitive, sensitivity training, that kind of stuff. She wants to change the rules of the laws so that if you do feel a certain way, you will be held accountable if you act on it. And mm. that's where right now we are, where everybody's pushing for police reform is like, okay, police have to be held accountable. When they yeah. break the law, they have to be held accountable like everybody else. But right now, the, 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 it, the problem is, it's like police have the license to kill and all they have to say is i was in fear for my life that's it yeah. they don't have to prove that they saw a weapon prove that their life was in danger you know we just saw in atlanta the man was was he was intoxicated all right but they already patted him down they knew he had no weapon on him and he was running away and they shot him in the back while he's running away like that's not but you know it, there's it has to be a system in place because if you don't have police accountability you know, it's like, it's like, you know, I, I have kids, right? I don't know how many of y'all kids, I have kids, right? If I told my kids, right, you know, you could do whatever you want to do. And then you come back to me and you tell me what you did wrong and what your punishment should be. That ain't no kind of system no parent would have. You know what I mean? And that's what we, so the, so the police come back and they, and they investigate themselves and they tell us what their findings are. I'm like, whenever, when, when, like, part of police reform should be that whenever a police officer abuses lethal force against someone, right, then you have an outside entity that then investigates them. That has nothing to do with the police department. That's how you create transparency. So when that outside entity comes out with their findings, you don't feel like it's corrupted. That's why guys who are playing, they want to get a second opinion when the team doctor tells them that they're okay and they can go out there and play. It's a conflict of interest. You know what I mean? But that's like common sense stuff that we should already have. And it's frustrating because we're taking these baby steps. 
like they're gonna put in, you know, sensitivity training, and they act like okay, they did a big thing. I'm like, no, that's that doesn't do it. <laughs> you know, we need more yeah. than that. It's real talk. It, they're talking about Black Wall Street if something like that happened today. First of all, they'd be outraged. But I think the difference is back then the racism was was more blatant, right? It's it was unabashed. You know, anything you guys make for yourselves, you guys band together, we're going to destroy that. It was unabashed, and that's kind of what the, the racism was back then. Now, it's more, it's hidden. It's systemic, right? They get you in, in little subtle ways here and there, right? And, and obviously, you see different videos of, of police brutality here and there, but just systemic stuff, like, like what Eton was talking about with the school systems and in underprivileged areas schools are underfunded because a lot of times it's just the tax structure like the poor people are paying the taxes and those taxes go to those schools they're not going to get as much money because the poor people don't pay as much in taxes richer places the rich people pay their taxes to their schools their schools are perfectly funded and, and overfunded at times so <laughs> that's that's little subtle ways to keep us down right voter oppression right a little machine malfunctions here and there where people Black people can't vote, or you send workers out there that don't know what they're doing at the, the voting stations where, where black people are, those areas. So different, it's, it's just more hidden and, and less in your face like that. They're a little smarter about it now. So it, I think it would be somewhat tough for an event to happen like that, but the same spirit is in a lot of the way the system operates now in different ways so it's it's more hidden and you know it's that's why it's it's such a complex issue because there's so many different you know so many different ways you can go about it when it comes to police departments when it comes to policies we need legislation change we need all that and and the little details and intricate details that need to happen to to change the system because a lot of people are saying the system isn't broken it was built that way it, it just needs to be changed and so systemic racism it's it's a lot of different areas and they kind of get you from all different different sides and that's why it's it's important to be aware of these things and know that that actually exists and now i think people are starting to face that a little more and and really look at themselves in the mirror and demand change Really wish we had more time to go over these things. Uh, it's been a great conversation with the two of you, both uh, Eton Thomas and Kalena Azabuki. Uh, I'm Monty Poole, my colleague Logan Murdoch. Uh, this has been one segment of Race in America, a candid conversation. Coming up on Race in America, the candid conversation continues with Raiders wideout Tyrell Williams and Dr. Amir Logan. We'll get their take on the NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell changing his stance on Colin Kaepernick's protest. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Race in America, a candid conversation. I'm Monty Poole. My colleague Logan Murdoch is joining me here as always. And we have two special guests. Uh, we are welcoming you to the show. First of all, we will have uh, Tyrell Williams, NFL wide receiver. Uh, Tyrell's been around the league for a while. He has some things to say. Uh, he has, his profile is raising. And uh, it's good to be good to hear from him. Welcome in, Tyrell. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate you guys. And also we have Dr. Amir Loggins, who uh, is a local celebrity uh, in the Bay Area here. He uh, has been around the market for a while now, done a lot of great things in the community. Uh, he lectures, he writes uh, freelance. He also uh, is involved with the uh, Know Your Rights camp with uh, Colin Kaepernick and uh, Eric Reed and those guys. So, uh, Amir, thanks for joining us, man. man thanks for having me. Pleasure. Yes, sir. And I want to start with, with the NFL because <clears> – <throat> Last weekend, Commissioner Roger Goodell said that he would welcome Colin Kaepernick back to the NFL. And as someone who's been close to this for a minute now, uh, Dr. Loggins, what did you think when you saw or heard that? 
as a writer and as a scholar, you pay attention to words. And initially, he didn't even mention Colin's name, right? It was something like he was bouncing back and forth with the players until they got to a point where they were like, apologize to all the players that protested and all of a sudden it's like, eh, I can't touch that because that's also inclusive of Colin. Then he came back and it was a thing where it was like, I would encourage, it was a certain kind of, encouraging is not demanding, right? I'm also aware of the fact that maybe two, three weeks ago, the NFL retired Colin mysteriously, right? And then after the workout, the NFL said they were done with Colin. So I'm understanding that I'm not a prisoner of the moment and I'm recognizing that what Goodell is doing is trying to put forth a certain kind of image onto the necessity of seeming as if they're willing to accept Colin. But you're not calling him. You saw, you're talking all this talk on your whatever Zoom chat, whatever little dungeon you in doing that talk. But have you reached out to Colin Kaepernick? and his agent or his lawyer, because that's when I know it's real, right? If you're saying that you've been advising for Colin to be in the league this whole time and you've been setting up these workouts and everything, then in some way by default, you're, 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 insin you're insinuating that the owners have came together as a whole and decided that he is not going to be a part of our league anymore. Right. And in order for all those things to come, even EA Sports removing his name from the um, song, like these things are not happenstance. These things require behind the scenes meeting and coordination. And I don't look at gestures just like the Black Lives Matters paintings all over the ground right now that's coordinated by the city. Right. You have to give the city has to get permission for you to block the whole ass streets off. In order for Colin Kaepernick to not have received a single call in the last four years, and I'm telling you that as someone who knows him, he has not received that call. That was coordinated because that means that everybody came together collectively at the same time and decided that this one person was not worthy of being included into this space anymore. And that's not happenstance. That's something that has to be colluded or done behind the scenes. Tyrell, uh, you came into the league uh, around a few years ago and, you 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 were aware of the Kaepernick situation. You saw what happened, and uh, first of all, take me back to uh, when Colin first decided to protest police brutality and inequality by kneeling for the national anthem. What were your thoughts at the time? Uh, you know, I, I appreciated him. You know, he's he's kind of set the tone for you know doing those protests and I think finding a good way to do it. Um, I remember being I was with the Chargers uh, during the game when he was he was there and he had taken a knee. And just the, you just see how the, the fans and everybody react and, and see being there and being a part of that and not really understanding what was going on at the time. I really didn't know a lot of why he was kneeling or anything like that. And then as things went on, you find out people were trying to make it about uh, the flag and disrespecting things like that. And I think a lot of information came with that and the media just ran with that. And they, they painted that narrative and they took away what he was actually trying to do. And I think that was the biggest injustice is, is, is the media framing it in a way that they wanted to frame it and not ever talking to him, never trying to figure out what he was actually doing, what he was trying to bring to light, what he was protesting. And he's doing it in a manner without using foul language, doing anything like that. He's not in anybody's face. He's doing it calmly, cool, calm and collect. And he's still getting backlash because of that, because people want to paint a narrative around it that had nothing to do with what he was actually doing. So... That, that to me is the, the biggest issue is never finding out what the actual reason for it is. And I think that's it's still going on today with the protests and the Black Lives Matter. People in the media are painting that narrative of what they think that that stands for. And it's really very simple and stopping the racism and stopping the police brutality. It's very simple. And I think the media tries to continue to run and take it way out of proportion up to what they want the narrative to be and what they want politics and, and branding and all of that stuff to resemble off of that. And I think that's the biggest issue that we're having right now is people just trying to duck away from and really just be uncomfortable with, yes, there's police brutality that needs to stop and there's racism that needs to stop. And I think for me personally, I'm sick of it being painted in a completely different way. You know, and if we continue to do that, there's never going to be any type of resolution. And I think the way Colin started it, the way Colin did it, it's clear that he's a great football player. It's clear that he should be in the NFL, and it's clear that he's being held out of the NFL for one reason. 
And I think that's a big injustice to him and to the what he's standing for and what we're all trying to stand for. We talked about symbolism to start this show. And one of the biggest symbolisms we see are these same uh, leagues and these same entities um, that said that kind of invalidated Colin Kaepernick, kind of invalidate Colin Kaepernick's stance, but invalidated it, um, saying now, you talk about Roger Goodell, who said that he disagreed with the protest as soon as it happened, to now saying he apologizes. I want to start with Left when I ask this question. How do you feel when these companies and these leagues are all of a sudden sympathetic to this cause? They say they're sympathetic to this cause. When you guys have been telling them this, that we are getting killed in the streets by cops. We are doing this. You guys have been saying this for years on record and putting your money behind these initiatives. How does it feel when you see um, all of a sudden the NFL is at least saying, we're sorry for this and um, this is important now. How do you feel about that? I want to start with that. I feel like we are in a moment of what Antonio Gramsci would consider cultural hegemony. And with the idea of cultural hegemony is even with the understanding, if you go from a theological perspective, when Constantine co-opted Christendom, is because the Christians were about to rebel against him. When he saw that, he's like, yo, either I'm going to co-opt that thing and absorb it and move it in my direction, which is why a lot of our holidays that we have that are associated with Christendom parallel with paganism, is because he co-opted something and made it his own, right? So in many ways, what the NFL is doing, what the NBA is doing because at the end of the day, the NBA comes off as very liberal, but they still blackball Mahmoud. They never apologize to Mahmoud. And as a matter of fact, their, their protest rules are more stringent than the NFL because they said you cannot do it. They banned it. The NFL didn't have that there, right? Baseball is just as culpable because Tony La Russa ducked his ass in there and started talking the same thing. Like all of these sports institutions, the same sports institutions that took their ass up there to talk to Trump the other day, right? Like they're all a part of the sports industrial complex. So what I'm seeing is a, including ESPN and, and these mega companies, I'm seeing them all, like ESPN had a special yesterday. It's like sports is back. Sports is not back. That's called propaganda. Sports is not back yet. The reopening of sports. Sports haven't opened. You have players right now in all the leagues protesting against the reopening of sports. And ESPN put out a, a piece of like a two-hour, hour-long piece saying sports is back open. How do we all feel about this as a country when sports isn't open? So that's actually a non-truth. So what I see is a collective of corporations coming together to create a narrative, right, that, oh, we finally get it. The reason I wore this shirt today it says drape the maniac. Drape the mania was considered a mental illness in 1851, a literal mental illness ascribed by a physician that black people had a mental illness because they wanted to escape enslavement. It was called drape the mania. Thus, I am a drape the maniac. We were like this isn't new. None of these things are new. And and and, and in order for you to be the overseer over of a league that is by far compiled of black folks. And at every stage, there's been some, cause, because before this, hell, if you go back further, there was still black segregation. Like there was segregation in these sports. Like to come into, to be a league to say, oh man, I just realized this is what's going on. How stupid do you think we are? But I know that right now, you know is the right time because the politics say, Look, let's be on the right side of history the second time that history comes around. You should have did it four years ago. And I do want to get to Terrell. And, uh, oh, make sorry, Terrell, my bad. I went on. Uh, I, oh, it's, I, it's all good. It's all, it's all good, man. It's really good. I, I do want to get to Terrell on this. You did put an Instagram post up recently um, about your experience growing up in Oregon and the types of racism that you faced uh, hearing the N-word on a regular basis. Can you shed more light on um, what it was like growing up in Oregon? Uh, yeah. I mean, at first, I want to say, like, I had a good, I got a good childhood. You know, I had great friends. I had great family. You know, I think that um, as I grew up being, I was really, truly the only black person in my classes. You know, I had an older brother who went through the same uh, system as I did, school system. And so I think we were really co to come a uh, couple of the only two black people 
in that school system. Um, and so the stuff we would hear on a daily basis, you know, it's a, it's a lot of just ignorant comments, people who think they're joking that probably something that they hear their parents say or, or something along those lines. And I think a lot of the racism, you know, we had a lot of Mexican students at our school and a lot of the racism was towards them as well. Um, and I think it's just, it's just a daily thing. You know, you hear comments, you hear, it's more of a discrediting uh, who we are as people just based off our color. You know, I, I feel like we would get a lot of, oh, I wish I was uh, black so I could be good at basketball. I wish I was black so I could be fast. I wish I was black so I could jump high. You know, it takes a lot of the discredit uh, of who we are just as people and the hard work that we have put in to put ourselves in those positions to be good at sports. Uh, I think one of the, the biggest things that we saw, me and my brother, uh, being two of the better athletes through that system, through our conferences, is going to places and people saying that, wishing they were black so they could be uh, good at this sport or make all conference or anything like that. And then you and then you also hear on the other side of it, you're getting called the N-word during the games. You're getting uh, all that type of thing. Um, and so that's that was the most frustrating part is for me in that post saying kind of an identity crisis and not knowing really where to fit in. You know, I got my, my dad at home is the only other black person that I know in the whole area. You know, and I'm around nothing but white people getting a lot of discrimination, uh, feeling uncomfortable about, un uncomfortable about that, trying to fit in and be who I am and the music I like. And then when I try to express those things, I get a lot of pushback saying I'm not black enough or I'm not actually black. So I can't have those uh, interests. And then, you know, trying to fit in in that way. And just as a young kid and hearing those things and trying to understand, OK, like, I don't really, I feel like I don't really have a voice. I can't express myself on the football field because uh, it just gets discredited for the work that I do. I can't have interest in music or anything with black culture because then I'm seen as I'm not actually black, so I'm just, I'm just faking it. Uh, the common uh, phrase I always hear when it comes about sports is, you know, we don't see color. We don't see these things. It's just all about the game and your teammates. And it's all about the common goal of winning a, a championship. I mean, while that, some of that may be true, and there's a common goal in winning a championship. I, I know personally I haven't seen um, – there's just this utopia. What have you seen in sports, uh, Terrell, where you see it's not that. It's, it's, you know, there's still racism even though I play football and I still play a team sport. How much have you seen that throughout your career? Uh, all the time. You know, I feel like a lot of the NBA guys bring that up, you know, because I think it's easier for them. They're, they're closer to the fans and hearing the racial slurs that get thrown at them. Um, in the NFL, you definitely hear it, though. You know, if you run an in and out of the locker room, you hear racial slurs, you hear all of that stuff. And it's, it's a constant week in and week out thing. And, you know, especially me growing up where I grew up, you know, I'm out in the country, real small town around nothing but white people. I mean, it, I'm hearing all kinds of racial slurs each game. And like I had said in, in my post that most of the time I'm not hearing it in basketball or track. Nobody wants to say it to my face where I can really see who who's talking to me in that way. You know, it's always going to be in football when I'm walking back to the huddle and I got 11 other guys behind me, and I don't really know who says it. Um, so I, that, that's the other part of it, the cowardness of the racism. Nobody ever really wants to just come in your face and be bold about it, at least in my experiences. And uh, that is also something that, that bothered me. I, I feel like, you know, as I've gotten into college and into the NFL, uh, you def it's, it's still there. It's still the same. You know, I, don't, I definitely don't see it with teammates. You know, I think obviously there's still comments. There's still ignorance in there. But I think that's where the education needs to come. And people just don't know any better. And I think that they really just need to be educated on that and actually go out of their comfort zone. It's going to take them wanting to learn. It can't just be us trying to constantly force that information on them and, and see you guys step out of your box. Like if you want to be accepting of everybody and you want to learn more about people, it takes it. You got to take it upon yourself to educate yourself and, and get rid of the ignorance that you have. And I think that's really where a lot of stuff now comes from in, in my environments is just the ignorant comments and, and stuff like that and it may not be just come they're racist or blatant racism, but it's still just ignorance that, you know, for myself, I'm not going to stand for anymore. I'm not going to allow that just to go by because as a young kid in high school and stuff, I kind of allowed that. And, you know, with all of this stuff now, I think it, it, I want to take it upon myself to be able to educate in those ignorant moments. You know, we all, we have been black all of our lives and we've seen a lot of different things. We've seen, uh, I know me, Monty and Left have seen, Oscar Grant, we've seen uh, Michael Brown, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, a countless amount of people. How did you feel but when you saw this one in, in comparison to the other uh, killings? Um, this one was definitely more, 
you know, heartbreaking. I think for some reason, I think it just, it just hit different to, to me personally. You know, I feel like it was just something that like, it's just unac- unacceptable. You're hearing, you're hearing someone beg for their life and you got many other people around as, as far as officers not doing anything to help as well. And you have people videotaping, standing around saying he can't breathe. Like just, I mean, all you got to do is, is move your leg. If, if you really want to just keep him on the ground, just move your leg off his neck if that's the case. But it, it, that, like, like he was saying, it's, it's, he's making a point to, for everybody to see that this is how, this is how it's going to be. If you want to make any trouble, this is how it's going to be. And I think that that's the, the most heartbreaking part about it is, is just the repercussions that come from that and seeing someone beg for their life and end up dying. You know, I think there's, there's not a lot of things that you can do that deserve that type of treatment. You know, if you, if you're going to be somebody who, commits a violent crime and you have just killed somebody or, or along those lines, then you have the force. But I feel like the force that is being used is there's, there's no reason for it. It, it just makes no sense. The, these people, if he robbed or if he had a fake bill, whatever it is that does not deserve to die. As far as the Wendy's incident that just happened as well, it, it's, he has no weapons on him. He has a taser, which is not a lethal thing. And he's running away and he's shot in the back. And it's like he's, he doesn't have a gun. He's not going to hurt anybody. He's just trying to get away from you. And you're the one with the gun and you're shooting him in the back as he's running away. You know, talking to my dad earlier today, um, it just makes you even more nervous to leave the house. You know, you feel like you're, you're scared to go a mile over the speed limit. You're scared to do anything wrong. You feel like you have to do so many and everything right so you don't run into any, you know, police disturb. You don't want, you don't want anything to do with them. And I think that that is, it's scary to know that, shoot, if I forget to turn my blinker on when I make this right turn, am I going to be pulled over and then what could possibly happen? You know, I think it just really brings into light even more how we feel and, and the, the, the nervousness that we feel just leaving the house, you know, and I think it's just, it's heartbreaking. It really is just heartbreaking. I want to go back to each of you one last time before we close it out. <clears throat> and I'll start with you, Terrell. When you see the energy in the streets that you're seeing these past few weeks uh, and you know that it's not just in this country it's global you're seeing it 50,000 people in on the streets of Sydney Australia Belgium UK Um, what do you take from seeing uh, the people the multicultural movement that you're seeing I think it's great you know I think everybody coming together like that it's great my only thing is I want it to continue you know it can't be a a week long thing. It can't be a social media fad. It can't be, you know, we're going to post for the next month because we're outraged right now. This is something that is going to a year from now, the, the same that you have to be exactly, you have to feel as, as much outrage as you do right now. And when you saw that video next year, if nothing happens, that, that outrage has to stay or it's just going to be a same cycle and come, come right back. And I think that's the, the biggest misconception as, as, the white the people that are white see, I think they, they don't understand that this is, it's not just, it, it wasn't just a singular incident. It wasn't just George Floyd. It's been so many other things and there's, and it may not just be the killing. It's the being pulled over with guns pointed at you for no reason. It's, there's so many different ways that how black people are treated differently. And it can't be something that is just, we're going to do this for the next three months and bring light to it. And then we got to get back to our, you know, regular schedule programming. And, mm-hmm. and then once another thing happens, then, okay, we can protest for another month or whatever it is. It's, it, that can't be, it. it has to be in the light. Everybody has to be outraged equally and for ever until this is, until this is stops. It can't, it can't just be a, a short term thing. And, you know, and I think it is great that, you know, all these countries are doing these protests and coming together and white people, black people, Mexican people, everybody, all these, cultures are coming together to protest this. And it also just, it just confuses me how there's still some people that just don't get it. And that's, that's also, that's just frustrating. People just don't get it. And that's why this has to continue. We got to keep it going. People got to stay outraged so we can get these people to get it. Dr. Loggins, what do you, what do you, what do you see when you, what do you, how do you feel when you see the, this movement, when you see the energy in the streets? To piggyback on what the brother just spoke about, I don't think it's that they don't get it. I just don't think they give a f- They don't, maybe they know, they know. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't not know. Um, but when I see 
when I see folks in Philistine and on the continent of Africa, and I see folks in, in the streets in Australia and all these places, I also know that white supremacism has affected their indigenous folk too. The ones that they consider as the is it a society. They know what it feel like. Like if you, I mean, like I was telling some people a little while ago, there was a Polynesian Panther Party in the Australia area because that came off of the, as an extension of the Black Panther Party. And it wasn't there because it was fashionable, it was there because for, for a reason. And these extensions of American imperialism and white supremacism on a, on a global scale are why these seeing black folks die resonates in a very particular way because it's not like they just saying George Floyd. Just like we're not just saying George Floyd here. Like what happened to Brianna was an act of terror. She was sitting in her home, chilling, and some plain clothes officers broke in her house. And fortunately, and unfortunately, I guess some might say, her boyfriend could defend them with his, with his weapon. And Brianna's dead, though. She shouldn't be dead. And her, her killers are still on, on the loose. And they're not on the loose hiding nowhere. They're on the loose getting paid. So when I look at, when I see the world, I, there, I can look at it as like, man, this is cool. Man, this is dope. And then I can look at it like, man, this is sad, man. Everybody feel this pain. Like, this is sad because I can pull up quotes from Patrice Lumumba before he was assassinated by the U.S. with assistance from the U.S. government, and they would fit into right now. I can pull up work of Bantu Stephen Biko and his ideas of black consciousness and the necessity of black consciousness, and they work right now. I can pull up, I can pull up words from David Walker's appeal in the 1800s, and they work right now. The same reasons, vagrancy, and all these misdemeanor laws that the slave patrols went and rounded up in, enslaved Africans who were seeking their freedom or who were free and just didn't have any papers, which I would consider an equivalent of, you don't have your license and registration. Those are your papers. The same things are happening right now. So it saddens me that we are still dealing with the historical trauma of anti-blackness in the West. It saddens me that, Mal as much as I, I love Malcolm X, and it saddens me that every word he said is still absolutely spot on relevant. Baldwin should be an extinct, a relic of idea, but Baldwin is not because he wrote about America and how America treats then at that point, they may have been calling the Negro. And the way they treat the Negro during that time is the way they treat us now. Abraham Lincoln had no, he had no love for us in that way. It was a strategic move. Secondly, he allowed the border states to keep their slaves, so he didn't free them. Thirdly, mo uh, damn near a million enslaved Africans walked off of those plantations before that proclamation came into place, as soon as the Civil War started. So I think a part of what we have to do, which is a part of the reason I choose to redefine police brutality as police terrorism, is that we have to start defining things for ourselves. Because if we look at the Emancipation Proclamation and that, that the freeing of the enslaved folk as, no, actually they left them plantations because ultimately Lincoln can't free slaves in the Confederate states because they seceded from the Union. He had no jurisdictional power over those states. So how can you free somebody you have no power over? They walked off that plantation because they felt like it. And that's black power. But we choose to look at it like, man, he the, the white savior. No, that's black power. They left. And we have to start reframing the way we look at things. And so when I see Black Lives Matter as a mantra, in some way I feel like it's outdated and it's passive. That four years ago, maybe that mantra worked. But maybe we may need to revert back to saying black power movement, black liberation movements. Because we're not trying to matter. We're trying to be liberated. That is Dr. Amir Hassan Loggins. Thank you for your presence. Thank you. Tyrell Williams, thank you for your presence. Jeez. On behalf of my colleague, Logan Murdoch, I'm Monty Poole, and this has been Race in America, a
and a conversation.